Kate, what if I gave you $2.82 billion? Was that a, a B? Billion? Billion with a B. What if I gave you <laughs> $2.82 billion? I, um, you know, I'm speechless. Uh, that would be a, a wonderful gift. I don't know what I would do to deserve that, but... What would you do with it if you had Oh, what would I do with it? Yeah, what would you do with it? Oh, I think I would buy a couple of homes. I would retire, definitely. Sorry, Elaine and Evan. Um, Jeez, buy a couple of nice bags. So you're going to buy a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm going to stimulate the economy. Okay, okay. Is that it? Are you going to leave some to your future Oh, I think I would retire and then create my own foundation and, and... Spend the money charitably. What would your foundation focus on? Um, and again, two point eight two billion dollars. You could do a lot with almost three billion dollars. The financial planner in me, you know, that still beats strong. I think I would do something around financial literacy. If you were to pass it down, how long do you think? How many generations do you think that would last? Ideally forever. A billion, two billion is a lot to spend. 2.82 billion dollars. In 1877, shipping and railroad tycoon, the Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt died, and he left his oldest son in a state worth more than 100 million dollars, which today would be 2.82 billion dollars. Less than 100 years later, 120 members of the Vanderbilt family held a reunion, and not a single one of them was a millionaire. Wow. Less than 100 years. The squandering of the Vanderbilt fortune is a generational wealth tragedy of historic proportions. How did one family manage to lose billions of dollars in only five generations. Hi, my name is Chris Wakefield. And I'm Kate Arndt. And on this show, we are going to explore what makes our economy tick. We'll interview the experts, learn about how economic changes can impact you at home, and we'll find a way to make it make sense. Episode 5, Generational Wealth. This podcast is brought to you by Beetle Financial Consulting. Founded in 1989, our client-first approach is built on transparency and trust. No commissions, no products, no conflicts of interest. Just confidence and peace of mind. Trust Beetle. To understand how the Vanderbilt family lost their fortune, we have to go back to where it all started with the Commodore, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And to help us tell that story, I called a historian. My name is Jeff Nelson. I am the archivist for the Saturday Evening Post. And Jeff, talk to me about how the Commodore started to build a shipping and rail empire in 1810 at the age of only 16. He borrowed $100 from his mom and bought his own boat. And he started um, doing a ferry service uh, between Manhattan and Staten Island. And from that ferry service, uh, he got enough success that he got several other boats, and after a while, he was the premier provider of water transportation in New York, which earned him the nickname Commodore. He got in on one of the early stages of advanced technology because somebody hired him to operate a steamboat, and up till that time, it has all been sail, so he was on the cutting edge of the new technology. And as his shipping business grows, Cornelius Vanderbilt starts to buy railroads, And And he he consolidates a number of small railroads into the New York Central. The railroads don't go very far into the country. They're mostly running along uh, commercial lines where there is money. Just like, think of the early days of electricity. Electricity went where there was money. So did the railroads. And so um, he was predominantly uh, making his money out of New England, but only the areas in New England where commerce was heavy. A few years after starting the New York Central Railway, the Commodore makes his first million dollars, which at that time in the early 1800s was all but unheard of. He had unimaginable wealth, and the whole race to become wealthy had yet to start. 
uh, with the Gilded Age. That would come like half a century later. So his money removed him far from the normal existence of everyday Americans who were earning pennies uh, on, uh, for their daily wages. And just for perspective, Kate, a million dollars in 1830 is about $32 million today. So you can imagine what it would have been like to have the levels of wealth Cornelius Vanderbilt had. He would soon become the richest person in America. After almost 70 years of building his shipping and railway monopoly, the Commodore died in 1877 in Manhattan. With his company, the New York Central, he had amassed a fortune of over $100 million, which today is the equivalent of $2.82 billion. As a first-generation Vanderbilt, what we call G1, he had more money, Kate, than the United States Treasury. Oh my gosh. He had more money than the government. In his will, he does two very important things with all that money. One, he leaves Central University in Nashville, Tennessee, a gift of $1 million. That institution quickly changed their name to... (gasps) Vanderbilt! Vanderbilt University. That's where the name comes from. The second thing he does is he leaves his fortune to his oldest son, William Henry Vanderbilt. And before we dive into how the second generation, G2, of Vanderbilt's dealt with the family fortune... I wanted to get a better grasp of generational wealth and how it should be handled. Hi, my name is Evan Beadle, and I am the owner of Beadle Financial and director of strategy and finance for the firm. And the first thing Evan is going to talk to us about is first-generation wealth accumulators like Cornelius Vanderbilt. Yeah, so G1 would be the originator of the wealth, the accumulator of the wealth, the uh, typically the entrepreneur, the one that established, built a company, uh, did something to, to to build the wealth themselves. Evan says that G1 is typically frugal and is not as willing to spend money as the successive generations. For the most part, they maintain the same lifestyle they had before they began to accumulate wealth. The trouble starts when the first generation does not effectively communicate or educate their children about wealth and how to properly handle it. Well, I think it deteriorates by just lack of understanding and financial awareness of the level of wealth that that G1 may have. Um, You know, G2 can look at it and think that the wealth is much larger than it actually is. And when there's not that financial communication going on, uh, the lifestyle, which uh, is easy to increase, difficult to decrease, can easily happen. Kate, I'm going to throw this question to you before we get Evan's answer. I asked him what he thought was an appropriate age for the first generation to begin to talk to their next generation about finances and wealth? I think finances in general, it's got to start at a, a really young age, maybe around, I don't know, their ages five to 10. It really, financial education can't come soon enough. And what about how to handle wealth? I think it could start with, you know, their first job. It, it really like I said, can't come soon enough. I'd say high school or college, um, a basic, you know, financial 101, financial literacy is probably appropriate at those ages. Um, you know, there's, whether it's talking about spending, being frugal, understanding, you know, the difference between wants versus needs. Um, and then in college and, and when they have income themselves, it's, it's thinking about the importance of saving and you know, into appreciating assets versus depreciating assets, right? So thinking about stocks and bonds and and real estate versus spending money on depreciating assets like cars and clothing. So with that information, Kate, how do you think the Commodore's son, William Henry Vanderbilt, handled the $100 million fortune? I'm going to say he was a spender and lived lavishly. I know how this story ends, so um, it it can only be one answer. I'm going to be honest with you. I set you up. The Commodore must have had some serious conversations with the sons because William Henry Vanderbilt manages to double the size of the family fortune. 
I'm well, sorry. Well, wow. I I'm, set you up. I think we need to talk about G3 then. Whereas his father, Cornelius Vanderbilt, was the richest person in America, his son, William Henry, becomes the richest person in the world. How does this go from the richest man in the world to no millionaires in the family? The stakes are definitely heightened. He turned his 87% stake in New York Central into the equivalent of $6.1 billion. Wow. And that could have been the product of lessons learned from his father, the Commodore, but Jeff Nielsen tells me it was likely something else. William, at the end of his life, said that he had never really been happy with any of the money. He said, it's, you're constantly anxious about it. You're constantly worried about it. William Henry was so anxious and conservative about money, he once cashed out $35 million in company stock and decided to invest it in one of the most safest conservative investment vehicles known to man. This guy bought $35 million in government bonds. As a second generation Vanderbilt, William Henry should have had all the tools he needed to prepare his children for a successful future of being handed the family fortune and fostering wealth. Upon his death in 1885, William Henry, his massive fortune was divided between his two sons, William K., and George W. We'll start with, get this middle name, William Kissam hmm. Vanderbilt. He was a Kissam. He inherited about 70... Sounds wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a wealthy man's name right there, Kissam. <laughs> he inherited about $70 million of his father's fortune. And while later in life, he wasn't too interested in running the family business or growing his fortune... A lot of his money troubles can be traced to his first wife, Alva Smith. When Alva marries William Kissam in 1874, she sets out almost immediately spending the family fortune for one specific reason. Alva is ready to spend all the money she can, which is considerable, to... Um, to get into high society. She wants the approval of people poorer than her, but she doesn't consider it that way. What she wants is not the money, she wants the approval. She wants the acceptance and the feeling that she has become upper class. She came from a Southern family whose fortunes suffered in the Civil War. And as Jeff explains, Alva and William Kissam are already one of the wealthiest couples in America, but they aren't immediately accepted into New York's high society. Well, there are several f uh, families whose uh, approval uh, Alva wants, mostly uh, Carolyn Astor. She is the queen of high society, and she looks down on the Vanderbilts as newcomers. The Astors, of course, have their fortune uh, much like a generation more. Uh, at the time, you were considered to be new money if your family had not been rich for over three generations. And, of course, Alva who is an extremely ambitious and rather ruthless woman, um, is married into only the third generation. So she pulls out all the stops to be accepted. Now, the funny thing is she has all the money she needs to consider herself rich, but until somebody else considers her rich, she ain't rich. Kate, get this. New York socialite Carolyn Astor maintained a list called The 400, this list, which Carolyn created and maintained with her friend Ward McAllister, was essentially the who's who in New York high society. If you weren't on the list of the 400 or the 400 list, you weren't important. And Alva Smith, who Caroline considered new money, is desperate to get on the list. Quick question, Kate. Why do you only think there are 400 people on the list of 400? I, um, I love this. Why only 400? It's in New York. It's one of the largest cities in America. The largest. Why it's limited to only 400? Right. 400 seems a little excessive to me, but um, it's the amount of people that could fit in the largest event space there. Because Carolyn Astor's ballroom in her mansion only held <laughs> 400 people. It. Of course, it has to be a social thing. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? In her first attempt to impress Carolyn Astor, Alva helped found and fund the New York Metropolitan Opera. 
but even that wasn't enough to get on the list of 400. So her next stunt was one of was one that New York High Society wouldn't. For, you're distracting me. I thought you were going to sneeze. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> In her first attempt to impress Carolyn Astor, Alva helped found and fund the New York Metropolitan Opera, but even that wasn't enough to get on the list of 400. So her next stunt was one that New York High Society wouldn't forget for a long time. I'm on the edge of my seat. Alva stages a, um, a ball in Lent when you just didn't do that. And she knew that there would be no other parties, and she knew people would be ready to come to a party, and she pulled out all the stops. She had immense amounts of money spent. People on the sidewalk watching um, porters bringing in life-size wooden horses that had been covered with horse hide. Apparently, they had uh, killed and skinned horses to make fake horses for this party. And it's just one of the things that's going on. The party is so big that Carolyn Astor has a hard time um, ignoring it. But Carolyn's daughter says, I'm going to die if I don't go to this. Kate Alva Smith spent the equivalent of over $6 million for one party. I wish I was on that list of 400 people. But it is enough to impress Carolyn Astor and the Vanderbilts are finally added to the list of 400. A small price to pay to be recognized by the most elite of the elite. In addition to sponsoring things like operas and throwing multi-million dollar parties, William Kissam, Vanderbilt, and his wife Alva also built one of the largest mansions on Fifth Avenue. They spend even more money on yacht racing and to build their art collection. You can see how the money quickly begins to fade away. In addition, William decides to shift control of New York Central in 1903 to an outside firm, so the family business is no longer the family business. That was just one of the members of the third generation, G3 of Vanderbilts. Obviously, he wasn't too careful with his share of his father's $200 million fortune, so what about his brother, George W. Vanderbilt? In keeping with recent family tradition, George W. was not very careful either with his money. Most famously, in 1895, he and his wife Edith spent over $6 million building the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. Have you heard of it? I've been there. You've been to Biltmore? Mm Mm-hmm. Tell me about it. It's gigantic. It's got a beautiful lawn. Um, Did you feel wealthy? No. Oh. It cost the equivalent of almost $211 million today. I mean, it's still standing. It's a tourist attraction. It sits on 30,000 acres of land and has over 250 rooms. It was and remains the largest privately owned house in the U.S. I asked Jeff Nielsen at the Saturday Evening Post why the third generation of Vanderbilts were so irresponsible with the money they inherited from their father. I think it was a matter of vanity. He chose William to be his heir because William was most like him. He wanted to basically perpetuate William Vanderbilt after death. So um, William got the choice and he really had no idea about what would happen. Evan Beadle has another theory when it comes to the second and third generations that squander their inheritance. I think the main thing is just entitlement of not being willing to bring in income for yourself. So it's, I'm going to lean on the portfolio for income. I'm going to lean on the wealth for income versus um, turning on the faucet, if you will, for myself of, of bringing in cash flow and income to subsidize my lifestyle. And once you start throwing $6 million parties and building $200 million mansions, Evan says that's a hard lifestyle to maintain, no matter how wealthy you are. It's super easy to increase your lifestyle. Um, It's fun to increase your lifestyle. It's nearly impossible to decrease it. Make It Make Sense is brought to you by Beetle Financial Consulting. Fee-only, comprehensive wealth management for all generations. Trust. 
Kate, we are up to the fourth generation of Vanderbilts, and it's time to meet Alfred Gwynn Vanderbilt. When his father, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, died in, 19, or in 1899, Alfred inherited $72 million. That's the equivalent of $2.6 billion today. So even the fourth generation is getting almost $3 billion. Where does it all go? Jeff Nielsen tells me things in America are starting to change. The days of the fading of fading fortunes of railroads lay in the future. In the 1920s, the New York Central started to really hurt because automobiles were replacing trains for transportation. And it was the beginning of a long slide for the railroads and for the Vanderbilts. There was actually hope that Alfred would be able to save the Vanderbilt fortune, but sadly, he died along with 1,000 others when a German U-boat struck and sank the RMS Lusitania. Oh, wow. Those are the events that helped bring on America's entry into the First World War. His brother, the other son of Cornelius Vanderbilt II, Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt, inherited $15.5 million on his 21st birthday. Okay? You turn 21, he has a check for $15.5 million. That would be the equivalent of almost half a billion dollars today. Reginald went out that night oh, no. on his 21st birthday, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that same night, and he lost the equivalent <gasps> of $2.4 million just gambling in a way that oh, night. Oh, jeez. Like, it's my birthday. I want half a million on black. Here it is. Oh, I lost half a million more. He lost mm. $2.4 million gambling. Typical male. That would be a good indicator of how the rest of his life would go. He spent the next 24 years spending his entire fortune on alcohol and gambling before he died at the age of 44 of liver cirrhosis in 1925. Oh, wow. He died completely broke and in debt. So we're at the fourth generation and someone has died broke and in debt. His daughter, now we're up to the fifth generation, his daughter Gloria Vanderbilt inherits $5 million on her 21st birthday. And by the time she dies in 2019, 142 years after the Commodore left his son almost $2.8 billion, 142 years later, Gloria, Generation 5, leaves her son, CNN anchor Anderson Cooper, an inheritance of $1.5 million. Wow. It took... 142 years to go from 2.8 billion to 1.5 million. While other things helped lead to the erosion of the fortune during those 140 years, like the estate tax, gift tax, income tax in the early 1900s, a few bad investments during the Great Depression, the vast majority of the Vanderbilt fortune was wasted on things like building triple mansions on Fifth Avenue in New York City or giving away large amounts of money to Metropolitan Operas and Columbia and Yale Universities. When reflecting on the Vanderbilt fortune, Jeff Nielsen says the family's lack of education and finances, combined with their refusal to work, was their ultimate downfall. Somehow it will always be there. And this was continued from father to son, from father to son, you know, and Eventually, it, it's gone, and I'm sure they must have been mystified. Their, their financial advisor says, I'm sorry, you're bankrupt. And he said, how can that be? I get, I, my dad was a multimillionaire. Well, you spent the money. I couldn't have spent the money. Yeah, you did. You didn't know how it came in, and you didn't know how it went out. Even more damaging was the later generations of Vanderbilts who refused to work and keep and grow their fortune. Evan Beadle says that when generational wealth is squandered, the losses can cut a lot deeper than just finances. You know, look, it's not just about the loss of generational wealth. Um, it's also about the destruction of family relationships and the emotional stress that co comes along with it. So when you have families that have either had third generation who, live, again, lives that lifestyle and ends up losing the money, there are, there are always, in my opinion, broken relationships along the way. Um, so it's much bigger than the financial ramifications in most cases. It's the emotional side and the disconnect of your closest family members that you, you see more than anything. 
As always, Evan says communication and education is key to avoiding catastrophic erosion of generational wealth. So, so that's where, again, the education that comes into play of, of, hey, you know, we want you to, you know, be stewards of this money and be able to manage it and have it grow over time. Let's look at the overall financial picture of your, your needs versus your wants, whether you need to buy, you know, a house or things of that nature versus you spending the money on your wants, uh, like, like a nice flashy car or something that uh, can, can be a depreciating asset. Part of what we've established is uh, a program called Generation Next for almost 15 years of helping the younger generation establish a solid financial foundation for themselves. So if they're able to build their own wealth and able to have a, a better understanding of, of how to manage wealth, then the parents, the first generation, G1, uh, will be more comfortable transitioning that wealth onto them uh, and, and it will be you know, more stewards of that money and have financial responsibility along the way. So it takes time, right? Um, there's no pill they can swallow or, or shortcut to take. Uh, it's an ongoing uh, education that, um, you know, is not an easy thing, and, but, but can be done with appropriate, appropriate teaching. Evan also talks about the importance of estate planning. So estate planning is very important when it comes to wealthy families. Um, a lot of times it's the decision of, should I pass along wealth to my children during my lifetime? Uh, should I pass it on after death? Um, are they responsible and able to take care of that money during their lifetime? Or should I just avoid the topic and, and hope that after I die, you know, it's their problem? Uh, so having a team approach of a financial advisor to do that education of being able to have that solid financial foundation so this next generation is is knowledgeable enough to be able to, to manage that money appropriately, having the investment advisor there to invest that money over the long term, having the tax advisor to do things that are tax efficient, um, all comes into play when you're creating a state plan uh, to make sure the strategy is, is you know, customized for, for the family. But everyone has to have the appropriate knowledge and background to be able to manage uh, this money uh, and have that that, that mentality across the board. Overall, keep in mind the big picture and make sure your family is on the same page when it comes to money and how future generations should handle it. Lack of communication, discipline, and planning were the biggest downfalls for the Vanderbilts. They thought money could buy happiness. It seems like with all those mansions, lavish parties, and priceless works of art, they never really found what they were looking for. William Vanderbilt said that he never enjoyed um, his wealth. He said, I have a next door neighbor who has a smaller house. He has fewer horses. He doesn't even have a yacht. And I know that he's happier than I am. And I can't tell the difference between him and me, except that I have more money. If I had less money, it's possible I could be happier. So while Jeff Nilsson keeps exploring the archives of the Saturday Evening Post, and Evan Beadle advises the next generation of clients at Beadle Financial, we'll keep trying to make it make sense. Make It Make Sense is hosted by Kate Arndt and Chris Wakefield. It is produced by Beetle Financial and recorded at IBJ headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. The graphics are by the lovely Amy House. And for show notes and financial news and information, visit BeetleFinancial.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>